Go for it. Just to remind me that I'm standing on holy ground. You know that poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning? Everywhere burning bushes, but only those who take their shoes off notice. Yeah. So, Serge, I don't know if it's the, the tradition to read the text that I'm speaking from, or to just, I should just do? Just do it. Okay. So, I'm actually not going to read it, um, because I talk about it, and, uh, yeah. So, good evening, everyone. Good Shabbos. Good evening. Good Shabbos. So, I greet you with the joy of Abraham, our father in faith. And I want you to know what a gift it is for us to be here with you tonight, deepening our connection and consequently learning more about one another and about the God that we serve. On behalf of the First Presbyterian Church of Brooklyn, I bring you warm greetings from our clerk of session, Patrick Torino. He couldn't be here tonight. But also from our elders. Um, so to Rabbi Serge, to Sue Gold, I don't know the president. I know I missed that. David, yes, to David, it's good to see you again. And to the entire Brooklyn Heights Synagogue community on this occasion of our third joint celebration of the life and faithful witness of Martin Luther King Jr., um, I greet you. So I'm focusing on a very small portion of the much larger text that was assigned for this evening. It was actually three chapters long. Um, but I'm focusing at the beginning of the Torah portion in chapter 7 because in just those first few lines are indicated some critical postures and attitudes that I think capture the struggle these players are caught up in, capture the struggles that Dr. King battled in his lifetime, and also capture the struggles we continue to resist 50 years after his death. The players in tonight's text are the Hebrew people, enslaved in Egypt and forced to serve the ruler of that land. The players are two brothers, Moses and Aaron, sent by God to demand the release of the captives, sent together because Moses is not yet confident that he has what it takes to do that which God created him to do. There is a pharaoh, the supreme ruler of Egypt, a complicated human being, as all human beings are complicated, who waffles, who goes back and forth and forth and back over whether or not he will release the slaves whose labor he and his people have enjoyed for generations. And there is God, the creator of all things. God, who not so long ago, in the words of James Weldon Johnson, looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. The great God Almighty, who is always in the business of life and life-affirming activity, comes to these chapters, chapters 7, 8, and 9, protecting the cosmos that she has created. And I believe there is something to learn sitting with, walking alongside, putting ourselves in the shoes of each of these players. This is a story of agency and two brothers who are mouthpieces for the holy. This is a story of second chances and third chances and ultimately ten chances to get it right and let God's people go. This is a story of plagues and hard hearts and multiple pleas to make another choice. Make another choice, Pharaoh. Make another choice. Any other choice than the death-dealing, anti-creation choice that puts you on a sure and certain crash course with the God of the universe. Like Moses and Aaron, you too, Pharaoh, are stamped with the divine imprimatur, the imago Dei, the made in the image of godness. That means this story didn't have to end this way. It could have ended another way. But a poor choice leaves God no choice but to affirm life. While the book of Exodus is often thought of as a book about freedom and liberation, it is also a continuation of the creation story begun in Genesis. In it, God is writing what is wrong, reviving what is faint, resuscitating life. In it, God is creating a people for God's self, 
a people to serve him, a people to worship her, and no one, no Pharaoh, no one will get in the way of God's created order teeming with life. In this struggle, God will protect the cosmos because God is in the business of life. To upset the societal and ethical order is to upset the creational and cosmic order. It is to be caught up in a struggle that will not end well. Dr. King knew this, and he gave his life to this struggle, speaking truth to the pharaohs of his day. The death-dealing, hard-hearted pharaohs who flouted the rules of the cosmos by failing to live as God created them. There were and are pharaohs who betray the agreements of a just and loving society. Surely, failing to live as God created him was Bull Connor. Many of you probably remember Mr. Connor, the commissioner for public safety in Birmingham, Alabama in the 1960s. And Alabama's been in the news lately. Bull Connor turned water hoses and dogs on student protesters, and he arrested and jailed children as young as six years old. For 35 years, this public servant worked to enforce legal racial segregation and to deny civil rights to our nation's African-American citizens. Surely, hard-heartedness was alive and active when FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover sent Dr. King a letter saying that he was a fake, we hear that word a lot too, and a fraud. And the only way out that would allow Dr. King to maintain his integrity was to kill himself. Hoover's abuses of power and harassment of activists like Dr. King subverted what God imagined for him. Surely, the current inhabitant of the White House is failing to live into his image of Godness as he brings us back again and again to a time in history we thought we had left behind more than 50 years ago. Dr. King spoke into this human brokenness and this human struggle, knowing that to upset the societal and ethical order is to upset the creational and cosmic order. It is to be caught up in a struggle that will not end well. Make another choice, Pharaoh. Make another choice. Any other choice than the death-dealing, anti-creation choice that puts you on a sure and certain crash course with the God of the universe. In his sermon, Why I Am Opposed to the War in Vietnam, Dr. King said this about Pharaohs on crash courses with God. I am disappointed with America. And there can be no great disappointment where there is no great love. I am disappointed with our failure to deal positively and forthrightly with the triple evils of racism, economic exploitation, and militarism. We are presently moving down a dead-end road that can lead to national disaster. The home that all too many Americans left was solidly structured idealistically its pillars were solidly grounded in the insights of our Judeo-Christian heritage. All men are made in the image of God. All men are brothers. All men are created equal. Every man is an heir to a legacy of dignity and worth. Every man has rights that are neither conferred by nor derived from the state. They are God-given. Out of one blood, God made all men to dwell upon the face of the earth. And don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment. And it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you're too arrogant. And if you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. Be still and know that I am God. Those powerful words from Dr. King remind us 
that activities that deal death blows to the creation get God's attention. And God pushes back. God pushes back. The plagues symbolize creation run amok, creation disrupted, creation destabilized and weakened. These ecological signs of blood and frogs and locusts and death are signs of a deeper disaster. Colored's only water fountains and white's only lunch counters and firebombing churches and threatening little brown children who just want to go to school are signs of a deeper disaster. Muslim bans and dismantling health care and tax breaks for the rich that rob the poor and racist denials of protection for human beings from Haiti and other countries not appealing to some are all signs of a deeper disaster, a creation at odds with what God intended. The deliverance of Israel is primary, but the ultimate divine activity is the deliverance of the entire creation right now. Because at some point, there's no longer any point in waiting. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuseth to let the people go. And that was a poor choice followed by other poor choices, to deal death rather than life. And it starts Pharaoh down a path that becomes increasingly difficult to reverse. Again and again, God sends Moses and Aaron and Martin. God sends you and God sends me. With all this sending and all this possibility, God suggests change is possible. But change is a limited time offer in this story of creation. At some point, Pharaoh and Bull Connor and Hoover and Trump can't turn it around. God's created order that exists for the sake of love and justice. At some point, it can't be turned around by forces that are human. And the God of the universe must rise up and set out to save the creation. I have discovered over the years that I don't like preaching on Martin Luther King weekend. (laughs) I have discovered that I am uneasy focusing on one person when God calls all the people to support the flourishing of life. My preaching professor, J. Alfred Smith, spoke of the lazy rocking chair of religion that allows Christians to sit and gaze at the cross rather than getting up and getting out in the world to change it. And I worry that King weekends make us lazy and comfortable that we've done our good work for the year. Because what is true about Martin is true about Moses and Aaron and you and me and yes, even Pharaoh. We are all imperfect beings made in the image of God. If any of us can be tyrants, all of us can be tyrants. And if any of us can be saints, all of us can be saints. I don't want to spend another 50 years louding Martin or Rosa or Fannie Lou, but louding you and louding us and louding the God who created us to get up and get to work. Like Moses and Martin, we are flawed but usable. We are broken but part of God's good plan. I say all this to say that we are all on the hook for a piece of Martin's dream, which, by the way, was always God's dream. This struggle the Hebrew people experienced, this struggle that Martin and countless others died fighting, the struggle that we are even now resisting is a struggle for life. And we are each of us responsible for life, responsible to be mouthpieces for God's dream, responsible to make better choices that bring us closer to our made in the image of Godness. The biggest struggle is always the one with ourselves. Do we believe that we are touched by the holy? 
And do we believe that we're able to do the unimaginable? In this new year, with Martin's legacy at your back, may you struggle less with yourself as a being called to flourishing life for the sake of serving your God. May you stop struggling and live in acceptance and in awe of the God that created you for himself, for herself. And may you, like Moses, like Martin, like you, speak life and love to God's good creation to the glory of God. Amen. Reverend Thorne, thank you.